Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Profit Tool Belt podcast. You know, today it's me. I'm going to be talking because I keep getting the same question again and again from people, uh, which is great because I love hearing from you and I want to make sure I'm answering your questions more than, you know, um, more than anybody else's because you're the audience. The question is always around estimating. How do I estimate for profits? How do I estimate uh, uh, and win the job? How do I estimate and win the job profitably? Why do I uh, feel like uh, estimating, you keep saying estimating is a problem, but I win all the bids that I, I put out there. And I'm like, eh, we need to talk about that a little bit. So today we're going to talk about estimating for profits and sanity, the sanity in your business. And there's a whole bunch of components of your business that we're going to talk about today, almost as if we're sitting at a boardroom table and we're having a board of directors meeting for your company. So this is a very high level meeting to dig into the challenges you're having in the field and the challenges you're having in the office and the challenges you might be having pulling profits out of the business. And I'm going to show you where to look and what to do about it. And then at the end of the show, there's also a free download because I think you need some support materials for this. So uh, stay tuned for the episode. No, you're going to love it. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Profit Tool Belt podcast. Today, today I'm going to deal with a frustration that a lot of you contact me about. I get emails about this. When people send me messages that say, Dom, let's talk, you know, the when I tell you, hey, if you got a question, if you want to talk to me, send me a message and say, Dom, let's talk, and then we'll talk. Well, this is a question that comes up a lot. It comes up on the Facebook group. It comes up in one-to-one -one meetings. It comes up on side meetings. You know, I was just speaking at a heating and ventilation conference. So it was HVAC contractors, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, but also plumbers and electricians were there. And uh, I did two talks at this particular conference. I was the keynote speaker, and then I did a breakout session as well. And guess what? The conversation came up there. And it would come up again if I was speaking at a roofer's conference or a framer's conference or a uh, renovator's conference or a fix and flip conference or a cabinet maker's conference or trade show. It just comes up all the time. And the question is, how do I estimate for profits and sanity? Who wants to estimate so you know you're going to be profitable yay me but who also wants to be sane yay me and here's the problem with estimating badly is yeah you understand you're going to lose a few dollars but you're hoping to make it up later on volume and maybe we'll make it on the next job all that sounds very good doesn't it but how come the next job never comes and deep down when I was in this kind of trouble myself, and remember, I've been a, a couple of different kinds of contractors. Uh, <laughs> the first company I ever started was the Yo-Ho-Ho -Ho Light Co. I installed Christmas lights on people's houses. And the first person that asked me for a price, believe it or not, I didn't even know how to price. I just told them it was going to be 200 bucks. <laughs> I had no idea if I was going to make any money or not. I'm pretty sure I didn't. And then I went on to have uh, two different painting companies where I was the contractor. And uh, both of those companies, I had about two or three crews running all the time. So two or three jobs active in the field at any time. And then I also did a, a small home renovations company called Ladderman Home Services. Very small stuff, but uh, but it was me, just me, right? But I had, I didn't estimate, I priced jobs to win them. You know, I'd, I'd walk up to a house and if I thought that house needed pressure washing, I walked up and I talked about pressure washing. And then I go to the next house and I could see that they had sagging a sagging fence and they needed some fence panels replaced. And guess what? I was a fence repair specialist at the next house. And then I go to the next house and they needed their gutters clean. And guess what? I'm a guy who can do your gutters, right? I was the model for how to do this wrong. But where's the money going when we lose money on an estimate? It's not actually coming out of your pocket. My friend, it's coming out of your daughter's braces. It's coming out of your son being able to be on a travel hockey team or football team. It's coming out of your wife being able to take the vacation she wants or you to be able to buy a 67 Barracuda or whatever you want, right? Now, some of you are laughing going, Dom, 67, really? 68 or nothing, whatever, I don't care. That's where the money's coming from, right? Boy, I, I really hope there's something even called a 67 Barracuda right now. I have nothing, I don't know anything about cars. My favorite car right now, my favorite car anyway, is my 2001 Suzuki Vitara that I take fishing and hunting. So that gives you a pretty good idea of what I think a cool car is. But um, let's get into this. I want to talk to you now about something very serious, about how you can estimate for profits and your own sanity. Now, there's a couple of things that have to work together to make this happen. If they don't work together, then you're going to find you're burping and spitting and sparks flying off in all directions, right? It's the frustration that you might be feeling. And so 
this is one of those things that gets you to the next level in your business, you know? So again, I, and you've heard me use this analogy before. If you find yourself running a business, I'm just going to choose some numbers here. And the numbers don't actually matter, but I want you to focus in on what this company looks like. So let me just do a quick calculation here. Can you hear me hammering the calculator? So if you've got around five, six guys on your crew, and you're doing about $800,000 in sales a year. Now, again, picking I'm picking the $800,000 out of the air, but uh, the way I got to having five or six people on your crew is because you need to have an expectation, and this is a number I want you to use, that everybody in your crew contributes $150,000 in top line sales to your overall revenue. So I just take your employee count, 5.3 is what I calculated it here, um, times 150,000, and that's an $800,000 business. So I want you to picture that business. If that's not your business, think about when you're going to get there. If you're already beyond that in sales, if you're not 800,000, but you're 1.8 million, think about that. You're going to see in a second, it doesn't matter. But if you're 800,000 in sales and you find yourself beating your head against the wall, if you find yourself taking two steps forward and one step back, if you're wondering why this business was easier to run when you were 600 grand and now it's suddenly impossible at 800 grand, then the reason is you have broken systems. Actually, the reason that you're having this problem is a compliment to you and your skill, your cunningness. You know what cunningness means? Like the fact that you're clever, the fact that you're able to work through things that most people would give up and walk away on. It actually means you're an excellent business person. Because you're running an $800,000 business, but you're running it on $600,000 systems. Okay, so follow me here. You got to $600,000 on whatever system you use to get there. The marketing, the sales or bidding or estimating that you use to get those clients. And then you produce those jobs, right? And then you manage those jobs. You have the paperwork to manage those jobs. You have the people in place, however many you had to help you do that. And you delivered quality work. And then as you grew... You kept using those same systems, but here you are now at 800,000 in sales per year. But the problem is it's starting to shake. It's starting to get fuzzy at the edges and it's starting to burp and spit. The company's not doing well as well as you want. And that's because you're running your $800,000 business on $600,000 systems. Make sense? So what we're going to talk about today is how to break through that. Now, again, I want to say this at the risk of repeating myself, I'm going to repeat myself. It doesn't matter if you're 800,000 and 600,000 are the right numbers. You could be at 1.2 million and you're running it on $1 million systems. You could be at 10 million and you're running it at $9 million system, right? Either way, have you gone back to look at how you run the business? And by the way, listening to a show like this, thank you very much, is an indication again that you're looking for success. You're looking for a perspective. You're looking for new ideas, fresh ideas to old problems, so that you can move past it. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, okay? So no matter where you are in business, I'm gonna show you how to take yourself forward. Now, there's a couple of different, you know, imagine a juggler at the circus. And I'm not talking about the guy that's juggling three things. I'm talking about the guy that's juggling two chainsaws, a couple of bowling pins, a kitten, and his mortgage. <laughs> so you're, that's what you're juggling, six or seven things. The things you're juggling are this. When we want to estimate for profits and sanity, the first one is, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, and that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. See how annoying that is? The first thing is we have to understand our ideal customer. Now, you're going to say, Dom, you talked about this a million times. Well, yeah, I have. And the reason I'm saying it again is because maybe this time you'll start to say, well, let me think about what Rubino is talking about. Who is my perfect customer? Now, your perfect customer is different than somebody else's perfect customer because your perfect customer lines up with who you are, what your values are, what you really think is important in this world. Your perfect customer also lines up with the kind of people you have on your team. Your perfect customer also lines up with the kind of tools, literally the kinds of tools that you have to do the work, right? If everybody needs um, ditches dug or post holes dug, but you don't have the right kind of post hole digger to do it for your soil conditions, then it's not lining up for your tooling right? So you've got tooling, you've got all these things that need to line up, and then it has to be a profitable job that you enjoy doing. All of that comes back to something you've heard me talk about here as well called the strategic plan. As a matter of fact, if you're a fan of the show, if you keep listening, episode 172 is coming up somewhere at the end of November. 
And we're going to be doing the Q4, so the fourth quarter strategic plan review. This year, I, I uh, on your suggestions, thanks everybody, on your suggestions, every quarter, I walked us through a little piece of the strategic plan. So we're at Q4 right now. That'll be there for episode 172. But ask yourself this question, whether you're walking the dog, whether you're driving, whether you're uh, on an airplane or going for a walk, doesn't matter, walking through the shop, walking out to the field. Um, do you have a strategic plan for the business? Like, do you have your set of blueprints for how this company needs to run next? Remember, are you running an $800,000 business on $600,000 systems? Well, sit down at some point, as, as you've heard me say here on the show, as you've heard me say on the Facebook group, the free Facebook group called Contractor Strategy Group, leave the office, go for a coffee, face the wall, put some headphones in, have a blank book with the pen, and just start writing down what your plan is. Now, you can also take a picture of yourself having a coffee at that coffee shop and send it to me and I'll send you five bucks because I want to buy you that coffee. But you see how all these things are linking together? I need you to go and think about the future of this business. The systems work great at 600 grand. They're not working as great at 800 grand. The systems work great at a million, but they're not working great at 1.2, 1.3. The systems work great at 3 million, but we're falling apart at 4 million. It's just part of growing the business. It doesn't mean you're not doing things right. It actually means you're so good at running the business that you have gotten to the edge of possibility for the systems you've got, and you're just pushing it with all of your might. Well, now we got to change some systems because you can only push so hard and you find that you're actually slipping backwards, right? So the very first thing, do you have a strategic plan? Next thing, that ideal client. Do you understand who your perfect customer is? Now, let's talk in the residential world. Where do they live? What kind of houses do they live in? What kind of uh, family structure is it? Is it divorced people? Is it married people? Is it young couples? Is it old couples? Do they have uh, uh, children who are in, at school? Do they have children who've moved out? All of that stuff's important. I want to know what kind of car they drive. Do they drive Volvos or do they drive Dodges? Do they drive Duallys or do they drive uh, Prius? I, I don't know. Who's your perfect customer? And the reason that's important is very simple. And I cannot remember who I heard this quote from, but it goes like this. When I can explain a customer's problem to them better than they can themselves, they know I have the answer to that problem. And so a hipster couple who drives a Prius has a different set of problems in their home than a couple that lives on an acreage with a dually truck and a hobby farm. They're just gonna talk a slightly different language. They're gonna need different things. And so the better you understand your perfect client, the better you can market to that perfect client. The better you can market to that client, the better jobs you'll get coming through. So the very first thing we need to understand is our ideal customer. You've heard me talk about that on the show before. So that's the very first part of estimating for profits and your own sanity. Hope that's making sense so far because it's only part one. Well, part one is strategic plan. Part two is the ideal customer. Now, part three is something you've also heard me talking about, which again, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I've only really got a few tricks up my sleeve. <laughs> the next one is the end of job report. Now, you guys have heard me talk about it. I am so sorry. It doesn't have a more exciting title. Like, a, I don't know, like a, a the hedgehog bowling alley report or something crazy. It, look, it's just called what it is. It's the end of job report. At the end of the job, we do a report. Dom, what's it called? The end of job report. Why is that? It's a simple system. What does it do? Well, at the end of a job, we do a report. So what's it called? Uh, end of job report. Huh. Could you call it something else, Dom? Well, I could, but it's called the end of job report. Huh. Have you thought about changing the name? Well, I could. You're right. I'll tell you what. Let's go back and reinvent the grilled cheese sandwich. If you didn't call it a grilled cheese sandwich, what would you call it? Now the person would say, well, I don't know. Well, why don't you call it what it is? You tell me the title of the thing, grilled cheese sandwich. I could pretty much figure out how to make it. I don't have to watch a YouTube video. The end of job report is done at the end of a job. Now, why do we do it? And why do I sound like a broken record? You know, it just occurred to me, some of you may not remember what records are, but just stick with me. I'll explain in a moment. At the end of a job, I want you to do an autopsy on the job. Just sit down. Remember, at the coffee shop. Put in your headphones, face the wall, order a coffee, blank sheet of paper in front of you with your pen handy, and just look at the job on paper. Paper, having something written on paper allows us to remove emotion and add logic. Through business coaching and the work that I do, I show people how to remove logic or to remove emotion as a tool, either way they need to make a decision, right? It's one of the things I show people. 
So I want you to look at a job and say, well, we thought materials was going to cost this. It actually cost that. We thought labor was going to cost this. It actually cost that. We thought our overheads are going to cost it. Actually cost that. We thought various and sundry or miscellaneous was going to cost this. It actually cost that. We thought the site conditions are going to be this and site conditions were actually that. Now you look at it and after one job, you think, well, thanks, Rubino. That didn't really help much. You just told me we sucked at that last job. Good. Go do that again nine more times. And what you're going to find is patterns. You're going to find the patterns in your business. What you're going to find is something simple like, huh, why do we always estimate wrong, but it's the site conditions that change job to job? The next question is, well, what do I have to do differently to make sure that we don't get caught in this site conditions question? And so you start to make those small changes in your business. Remember, this topic today on this podcast is how to estimate for profits and your own sanity, right? So, so far, let's scan through what we've done. At the top of the chart, we've got, do we have a strategic plan? Then we've got, do we know who our ideal customer is? Now we've got the end of job reports and I've asked you to do 10 of them. Go do 10 and then keep checking back. Do I have the right customer in the right area who wants the right things for me? Who's willing to pay the right price? Do I have the people to do those kind of jobs? Do I have the tooling to do those jobs? And do I even enjoy doing it, right? If you're allergic to horses and all you build is horse barns, you're not going to be enjoying life very much, right? So think about all of that. Now that's a little bit of a loop. End of job report, ideal customer. Keep asking that question. Now, if that's a cycle, there's a little there's a little piece of exhaust coming off that cycle. And that exhaust, that steam valve, is something called the dashboard. I'll ask you this as a coaching question. Do you have a central place where you can look at your company operations at a glance? If you don't, that's something you need to work on. If you're stuck on it, obviously get in touch with me. You guys know how to just text me, 604 837 Eight three six one. Just say Dom. Let's talk. As a matter of fact, stay tuned at the end of the episode. I think I'm going to have a download along with this episode for you to be able to pull. Uh, that's going to help you with this. Okay. So now we've got. Follow me here. Go at the very top here. We're making a funnel. We're going to move from the general to the specific. So I'm doing an inverted triangle. My hands are wide. For those of you watching me on YouTube, you can see me doing this, right? So my hands are wide at the top, and then they come down a triangle down here. So at the very top, we've got a strategic plan. Underneath that, we've got our ideal customer. Then we've got this end of job report. And there's a little loop here between end of job report and ideal customer. And that's spitting off some info for our dashboard. If you don't know what to put on, what to put on the dashboard, get in touch with me. I'll show you how. Now, after the dashboard, we have to run everything through a filter. Okay, we got to run everything through a filter. Think of this as a machine. It's making those little noise, bonk, 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 all that stuff, but it's working together in harmony. Okay, so now that we've got the dashboard giving us information, now that we've got the end of job report giving us information, that information is drawn against jobs that we've done that work really well against the strategic plan that you set out for, the next thing is we're going to run it through the filter. And the filter is called how to find and fix your eight profit leaks because there are eight leaks in your construction business, in your contracting business, in your trades business. And they're the exact same whether you build high rises, whether you build bridges, or whether you build toy trains for Christmas for kids. It's still a construction or contracting business. There's always eight profit leaks. We can talk about them now, but I think I'm gonna make this the free download. If you want this free download, send a text message to me. And I'm gonna tell you my number a couple of times here so you grab it if you're driving or maybe pull over. Um, I think the best way to do this is just text me. My number is 604-837-8361 and uh, send me the keyword um, profit leaks. Let me just make a note here. Send me the keyword profit leaks and then I'll have Ella or Jara send you the document back. Okay, the, those are my assistants. So I'll have them send you the document back. But once we've got all this information, we're going to ask ourselves some very important questions. Where is the biggest leak right now? And which is the easiest leak for us to fix quickly? So we're looking for something that in coaching, I call easy wins early. Okay, so where are the easy wins that we can have in your business early, right? So using a business coach has to bring you a return on investment right? So right now you're not investing much. You're listening to a free podcast. So your expectations of me should be very low and hopefully I'm crushing them. 
But in reality, you're investing your time, which has a certain value. Some of you will recognize that from our revenue responsibility per hour conversation, but I'm not going to get into that today. If you want to get the most out of a podcast like this, then you got to take advantage of the tools. So keep listening to the episode so you start to understand the strategic plan, the ideal customer, the end of job report, the dashboard, and then what is the find and fix your eight profit leaks filter. So let me tell you what profit leaks you have in your business. And this is going to help you estimate for profits and your own sanity. So profit leak number one is you have low sales, which by the way, I get it. It sounds like the dumbest answer ever. Oh, you don't have very high sales. It's probably because you have low sales. <laughs> no, you have, you just have low sales or inconsistent sales or sales of the wrong products or services, right? So think about it in the bigger picture, but I have to have a, a, a way to capture that for you so that we can build a library, uh, a bookshelf in front of us. And then on that bookshelf, we'll have different categories, different empty binders. Each of those binders is a profit leak. You open it up and there's, we have tons of strategies for how to increase your sales. And you probably, by the way, don't have a sales problem. You probably have a marketing problem, right? You probably don't have a sales problem. You probably have a quality of leads problem, or you have enough leads problem, whatever it is. Obviously, we know how to walk, walk you through that, but that's prof, that's problem number one for why you're not estimating for profitable jobs. You don't have enough jobs to pick from. And so in the absence of choice, we're forced to make a bad decision. Didn't we all have that buddy in call in uh, high school or university? He just didn't, didn't date a lot of girls. And so he ended up dating one girl. She wasn't the right girl for him, but he carried it through all the way. And now they're no longer together. In the absence of choice, he left himself with no good decisions. Don't do that in business. Don't do that in marketing. Obviously, we talk about that a lot here on the show. Uh, no offense if you're that guy. All right. Uh, number two, are you still struggling with high costs? Okay. So a profit leak is you're still, there's still money going out of the company. Just the other day with one of my clients, we found out that uh, because he provides cell phones for his guys, he had let a guy go as happens. Um, and then we hadn't replaced that particular position with somebody that needed a cell phone. So there was a cell phone plan we were still paying for. And we'd never gone back to scan through the expenses to make sure that's a really tiny, tiny, tiny example. But that money still came out of that owner's pocket. So thankfully we caught it. But are you still struggling with high costs? They could be marketing costs. They could be storage costs. They could be processing costs, manufacturing costs, shipping costs, labor costs, not capturing costs and paying them, but not charging it back to the customer. So there's a lot of things under that, right? Number three, you still see wasted efforts. Do you walk up to your job site or, and, you know, for those of you that work on job sites, you'll understand this. For those of you that have a, a shop, like a cabinetry shop or a, 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 let's say your machine, machine shop, you walk in and you just see the wasted efforts because you're an expert. You know in a machine shop how to operate the brake. And you see the guy or the gal operating the brake and you're like, oh my gosh. They're just doing it wrong. They're burning my money, right? Or you're running a renovations crew and you see how the demolition is going and it takes a guy three trips to bring out one piece of drywall. You're like, what's going on here? We got to have a better system than that. But you just see the wasted efforts on your job site. Those are profit leaks that you pay for. Remember, it's not you paying for them. It comes out in your, your as your daughter's braces, as your son's uh, music practice, as your wife's favorite vacation or cash in your jeans to get that barracuda, right? Whatever it is. Um, okay. Number five, do you have a collections problem? Like, do you have just a flow of money in and out of the company problem? If you have a collections issue, there's a whole range of solutions we have to put in place. But remember, I want you to estimate for profits and sanity. So if you know you have a collections problem, we actually have to estimate a little bit differently because we have to take that into an account. Now, the other thing we have to do, if you recall, is we have our strategic plan at the very top, right? So I'm at the general to the specific. We're at the very top of the process. We have to have a good, solid strategic plan, a workable plan. And then we have to have an ideal customer definition. Well, if your customer right now that you think is perfect is also a customer, type of customer, that's causing you a collections problem, then you've got the wrong customer. You see, I'm not really that smart. I just see the lessons again and again and again. You just have the wrong kind of customer. So we've got to go out and get you a different customer. Well, you say, Dom, tell me which customer to get. I will say, well, I don't know. Which customers are the best right now? How do we market to them? Have we ever had a great customer? What does that customer look like? What do they care about? Where do they live? What does their family look like? What kind of car do they drive? What, you know, what are their questions? Let's go answer those questions. We'll answer those questions in marketing. You'll get better leads. Then you can make better sales. And we'll ultimately get rid of the collections problem. Just so you know, a collections problem is at the bottom end 
of our process of running a business. But the problem that we're trying to solve is at the top end. It's usually a marketing problem, not an actual collections problem itself. Um, okay, number six, this one's boring is boring. You're not working with budgets you believe in, but do you have budgets? Do you know what your overtime is going to cost on this next project? Well, you're going to say, well, Dom, I don't know how to calculate overtimes. They just kind of pop up. Well, no, they don't actually. <laughs> and we could talk about that more, but do you work with budgets you believe in? Do you know how much you're going to spend on adhesive next year? Do you know how much you're going to spend on rentals next year? Do you know what your carrying costs are going to be next year? Do you know what your cost to serve is? Do you know any of those things? And if you don't, then we got to go find it because you're running an $800,000 business on $600,000 systems, right? And at that $800,000 level, you're starting to see the wheels come off and you can't figure out why. It's because we need to apply a new set of tools to those same problems, right? Uh, number seven, bad accounting and forecasting. So does your bookkeeper or accountant have systems? Do you believe in those systems? Are reports being given to you the right way? All of this goes back to this problem that we have in estimating for profits and sanity. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want you to have the right tools at hand. You see all these things work together. And by the way, remember, this piece of the conversation is just the filter that takes us from the dashboard to know which action to take first, which action to take last, and what things we can ignore. Because you can't work on everything. You're still running a business and you're still trying to coach your kid's volleyball team and get your daughter to choir practice and get your give your wife a couple hours off because she's been watching the kids all day. You just want to be home for dinner like a normal dad or mom. Um, and then profit leak, number eight, you're going to, you've heard this one already today, is you work for the wrong customer or you're not doing the best jobs. That's a profit leak because you're wasting time and effort. You guys have probably heard George on the show before. Um, George is a house painter. Um, George was doing really small jobs. Like he was doing paint jobs for $2,500 each. And he wasn't even that busy. <laughs> George is super funny, by the way. Um, what, what did he call it? George said, I took a lot of unplanned vacations, <laughs> which meant that he didn't have gigs to do. And this happens a lot with roofers. Roofers make incredible money so they can work two days a week and only do one job a week and still make great money. But that's not really a business. That's more of a project company, right? They're growing to the point where they're gonna be a, a real operating company. But what did, we, what did we do with George? Well, we figured out who his ideal customer was, ideal client, ideal job. It was a different neighborhood than the one he worked in when we started. So where he could barely get $2,500 to do a job now, now he does eight and $9,000 paint jobs. And you guys have probably heard this before on other, on other episodes, but he now subcontracts power washing for 2,500 bucks because he won't even touch it. And he makes more money on that than he did painting the house, right? So George is now working for the right customer, but it wasn't, there's a difference between simple and easy, right? What, what's the saying? It's, it's not simple, but it is easy. You know, once you understand how to line everything up, everything just happens. But if you've got just one thing sticking, it's like trying to close a door and there's just a pebble in the door. And you're like, why won't this door close, right? This door won't close, but there's a pebble somewhere in there and it's stopping it from swinging through its arc. It's that tiny little thing that doesn't make any sense. You're like, how could that be such a big impact? But it is the impact. That little tiny thing, that little sticking thing is the reason why cotter pins work. It's just a tiny little piece of the whole thing, but suddenly the cotter pin holds in something else. Like it's crazy, right? So think about your business. The problems you have now all relate back to something that we've got to figure out. We can figure it out together, by the way. Hey, by the way, if you want that, uh, uh, those eight profit leaks as a printout, get in touch with me, send me a text message. My cell phone number is 604 837 8361. And then just say, what did we say the word was going to? Oh, yeah. Send me the keyword profit leaks. And then I'll have my um, somebody from my office send you the document. Just email it off to you. You can read it there. But uh, at least have this tool in front of you. Right. But let's keep in mind, let's go back and recap what we talked about today. Remember, the title of this is how to estimate for profits and your own sanity. There's some jobs you don't want, there's some jobs you want no matter what right? Well, let's figure out what those jobs are. So here's the process that we use to pick apart the problem and go after it piece by piece. First of all, we need a strategic plan. Ask yourself, do you have a strategic plan? If not, how do you get one, right? Next, do you understand your ideal customer, your perfect customer, your perfect job? 
Do you understand who that is? If not, how do you find out who that perfect customer is? Next, I want you to start doing your end of job reports. It's just an autopsy. How did we think we were going to do in that job? How did we actually do in that job? Let me tell you, a couple times you look at that report, it's going to stink. Stinky stinkerson. You're going to look at it and go, why is Rubino asking me to go do something that's painful? Because you can either stick your head in the sand or you can just face reality. That's why, right? We all do it in all of our, our companies. We have to do this. We just have to face the facts and the reality. Because once we have the facts, we can make the decisions, right? So now you've got the end of job report and the ideal customer looping through each other. It's going to spit off some things that need to go in your dashboard. A one page, at a glance, everything you need. Let me ask you the coaching question. Do you have the dashboard you need? If not, how do you get one? Where do you get one? If you don't know, then contact me and let's have a side conversation. We'll figure it out, right? Now that you've got the dashboard, you push it through the filter, the find and fix your eight profit leaks filter. Because as I said, for any company, it doesn't matter what company, any of Elon Musk's companies still need to think about what do they need to fix next? So all of us have these challenges, right? What are the eight profit leaks in your business? What is the order of priorities? What's the one that we can fix earliest for the easy wins early, right? How can we go about changing the business from within while we're still running it? Can you see I get passionate about this? I like I really like this stuff. I like it because I've seen it work so many times. I like it because I've done it in my own companies, in my own companies. For those of you who haven't listened to my shows before or maybe just started, please understand I'm not just some book learning business coach. I'm actually a business owner who's gone and built and sold a, a number of companies. Two of them have been what I would call ring the bell. I've done well enough on both of those, com- on each company on their own, I've done well enough that I could retire. Not well enough that my kids could retire, if that makes sense. But I've done very, 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 very well on those. And I'm sharing with you how to do that. I learned how to do that when I became a business coach, when I learned the simple systems. I've been a coach now for 22 years. It's October. So as at the time of this recording, by the time we hit next or this December, a couple of months, I will be a coach, a bit of business coach for 23 years. That's a long time. So I've seen a lot of things. I haven't seen everything for sure, um, but I've seen a lot. You know, I've seen family businesses. I've seen family businesses who struggle. I've seen families who understand that family comes first and business comes second, right? I've seen solo people start a business and go to rocket levels. And then I've seen them sell that business and reinvent themselves completely. I've seen partners do really well. I've seen partners work well or better together because they have better communication. I've seen a lot of things, but I haven't seen everything. I'd love to meet you and talk about it as well. But first, let's get your estimating fixed because the problems that we have in estimating become indigestion for the rest of the company. All right, let's stop there. Let's just stop there. I really appreciate the fact that you listened to the show. So we're going to wind it up here. Again, the um, the free download with this show, I'm actually, I like this. I like having a free download with the show. Uh, if you want that free download, send me a text message. My cell phone number is 604-837-8361. And just make the keyword profit leaks. And then we'll take care of all the details. I'll have one of the people from my office email you the, the, the form so that at least you understand where to start on looking for those profit leaks. Uh, and we'll leave it at that. Thanks very much for checking in, folks. Uh, I love having you here. We'll talk to you soon. Well, 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 there is Dom being a guest for Dom being a guest for you. I hope you pulled out a lot from that interview. There are a whole bunch of, of component parts that need to go together. But it's a little bit like working on your own transmission. Uh, You know, you have to know how to put the thing back together once you pull it apart. Estimating for profits and estimating for your own sanity, it has some inputs that you have to get right. And once you get those things right, it's just like doing the prep work for a project. All the prep takes forever. And then once you finally start the work, things start to take off. And uh, that's what today was about. So I won't repeat what I said in the episode because we, you know, I think we did a pretty good job in there. But if you do have questions, make sure you get the free download. Just send me a text, 604-837-8361. And just say the word profit leaks. And then somebody from my office will shoot you back the document. That's how you find and fix the eight profit leaks. Now, just because I'm making this the free download doesn't mean it's the start of the process. It's actually the end. It's the end of the process, if I could say that. You have to start with a strategic plan. 
here I am repeating myself, right? Then you've got to understand your ideal customer. And by the way, if you have questions about those things, then just text me at that same number and say, Dom, let's talk. And let's really dig into this business. Let's do what you need to do. Let's get you ready for this next year to be the biggest year you've ever had, where you feel more confident going forward than ever before. All right. Thanks for checking in, folks. I really appreciate you being a listener uh, and uh, participating. If you're not a member of the Contractor Strategy Group, it's a free Facebook group. Join us there. If you haven't left feedback on the podcast on um, Apple or on Google Play, please do that as well. That feedback is valuable to other people. It says that it's like a scent trail. It's like breadcrumbs. It tells other people, hey, this is a valuable place to look to get business building information. If you haven't joined your industry association yet, go join the industry association, whether it's the Fencing Contractors Association, whether it's the Interior Designers Association, the Architectural Millwork Association, I don't care which association it is, but start to hang out with other people who are asking the same questions as you and keep listening to this podcast because there's more and more info coming. If you feel like it's finally time for you to grab hold of the the rungs and get to the next level of business, get in touch with me. We've got a brand new program. It's called 10X Built. You can actually see it if you want at 10xblt.com. So that's 10xblt.com. It's a new program that I'm launching here to help. I want to help even more people than I've been able to help in the past. Uh, And that came about because I have a waiting list. There are so many of you out there And I thank you for being patient that I've got to find a way to serve more people better. And so we're going to be doing that now. So if you want to check it out, go to check out 10xblt.com, 10xbuilt.com. If you want a good giggle, what does built mean? Well, what we do is we build stuff. But if you want to have a nicer boat, go into a a prettier lake with a newer truck. That's BLT right there. Business, life, and time. Whatever you want BLT to stand for. Uh, Those are all the things we talk about. Uh, under that uh, banner. So go ahead and check that out. Anyways, thanks for checking in, folks. Stay tuned. It's Storytime with Dom. And remember, Storytime with Dom is transitioning. It's going to be questions and answers with Dom. If you want to leave a question for me, go ahead and do that. You just go to this specific website. It's called speakpipe.com forward slash ask Dom, and you can leave your question and you'll be part of a podcast episode in the very near future. Thanks. Hey, everybody, this is part of a new piece that we have here on the podcast where we've got question and answers with Dom. Today's question comes from Jeff Gratney. Now, Jeff is a member of the Contractor Strategy Group, which is a private Facebook group we have just for contractors and different construction business owners. He's an electrical contractor in Kalispell, Montana. And here's his question. What are some good methods for marketing? My niche market is government work, industrial, as well as build and design projects. All right, Jeff, I've got an answer for you. Hey, everybody, welcome to Questions and Answers with Dom. This is the segment that's going to be replacing Storytime with Dom because I've done about 300 episodes between two different podcast shows. And I want to be able to answer your questions more than just telling stories from the field and keep it relevant, keep it real. So I put the call out to everybody uh, and Jeff Gratney responded. Jeff is a, a big supporter I really enjoy having him as part of the community. He uh, put this question in the contractor strategy group. Now, some of you may have seen this question there already. uh, And we went back and forth a little bit. There's a couple others. Uh, Brian Steinhardt also posted a question. We'll be dealing with his coming up. But the contractor strategy group is a free Facebook group. And that's where he was able to put this question. Here's his question. Now, Jeff is uh, an electrical contractor uh, in Kalispell, Montana. Here's his question. What are some good methods for marketing in my niche market, which is government work, industrial, build and design projects? Okay. If you're in that same market as Jeff, where you are doing that commercial kind of work, government work, institutional, industrial, civil work, or the build and design projects, there is a way for you to market, but it's different. It's really different. And I want to tell you a story. I want to take you back to a story you might have heard or seen develop in your own city, in your own town, in your own county, in your own province, or in your own region. And that'll help us really shed some light on this. Um, the idea behind it is I want you to learn how to be a lion in a room full of zebras. Okay. So think about that for a second. I want you to be a lion in a room full of zebras and here's how it works. You hear about a new major event coming to your, like I said, state, city, province, or country. And that new event is like somebody wants to do something a little bit outside of the norm. Like they want to bring rugby to your town. 
you know, they want to have like a professional rugby training facility in your town. And you're like, oh, rugby. So I've heard of it. it. Sounds like a cool sport. Might be interesting. Um, and so they want to bring rugby to your town. You're like, well, that's interesting. Now, the head of it all is Chandler Bing. Now, you don't know this or, or sorry, Chandler Bing, we know from friends. But what you, know, you also know is you think, why the heck is Chandler Bing involved in this rugby thing? Is he a big rugby player? No. Have you seen Chandler? Uh, he couldn't even play eighth man in rugby. Right. That's a position in rugby, by the way. He certainly wouldn't be a flanker and he wouldn't be a prop. Never. I don't think he'd even be a back. For those of you who play rugby, you know these positions. But the head of it all is Chandler Bing. And you think to yourself, hey, why is Chandler Bing involved? I thought he owned a bunch of hotels. Why would he care about rugby? And why would he care about a new rugby facility? But anyways, time goes on. You know, for two years, the city's talking about this rugby facility and they're starting to get some interest from people some people are upset they don't think rugby should be here it should be more you know money put into football and children's sports that have opportunities for advancement and rugby is a weird uh, sport on the fringes why would we be investing in rugby but Chandler Bing stays on it and he stays on it to the point that suddenly the new rugby facility gets announced and a little while later you hear some funny other things in the news not only was the rugby stadium announced way east of town but there is going to be a Wyndham Resort across the street, which is a high-end um, hotel. And there's also going to be a La Quinta on the other side of the street and a Ramada on the other side of the street and even a Super 8 for the budget traveler. And suddenly it starts to come to life. You're like, I get it. I know why Chandler Bing was involved at such an early stage in bringing rugby to our region. He wanted to get an early step on this real estate on the eastern part of town and drive value to that real estate by being part of the early conversations. Have I confused you yet? So Jeff, what you need to do is you actually need to be part of very boring early stage conversations very early in the process. So here's how we market to be a lion in a room full of zebras when we're doing civil, institutional, and commercial work that has very long time frames. The first thing you need to do is go to boring events. Sorry. It's a, it's going to be boring events, a lot of Chardonnay. Um, uh, but here's where you're going to find it. Look, look in the back of your local business magazine and you're going to see some local events coming up. Um, here's the, uh, a fantastic one. You're going to see this listed in your local business magazine. You're going to think, oh my, why do I need to go to this? Dom said, I need to go to this. Dom said, I need to be a lion in a room full of zebras. And this is the name of the events we're looking at. Uh, the Ring Road Expansion Project Symposium. You want to go to that event. You want to go to the New Port Expansion Environmental Information Night. And the reason that you want to go to that is because when you're sitting there listening to some diplomat talk about, or the government bureaucrat talk about these things, you're going to be a lion in a room full of zebras because you know who else is in that room? Well, you're sitting there with some coffee and maybe a plate of hors d'oeuvres and on your left is an architect and on your right is an engineer and behind you is a, is a development real estate lawyer. And over there is the big money guy in town. And by the way, at the back of the room is Chandler Bing and his top three henchmen. And they're all in that room. And you think to yourself, I must be in the right place. Why are these guys here at the very early stages of talking about the ring road expansion project? Because they know that the earlier they get involved in these, the earlier they're part of the conversation, they can figure out who's who in the zoo. They can talk to the architects. They can talk to the engineers. They can talk to the land use planning people. And the more they get their name known, the more it's possible that they're going to have a kick at the can. So we've talked about boring events. You also want to find other local, state, or provincial events. Um, get involved with your chamber of commerce. So if uh, let's say your local chamber of commerce has like the Wells Fargo or Royal Bank economic forecast meeting, and it's held at some snooty golf course over in the snooty part of town. Yeah, that's the event you want to go to because guess who's going to be in that room? It's not going to be many other electrical contractors, I'm not knocking electrical contractors. I'm not knocking concrete contractors. I'm not knocking anybody. I'm just saying that who goes to that um, environmental for or economic forecast, I'm sorry, by Wells Fargo or Royal Bank are the people who care about the long term economic growth. And who's sitting around you? The architects, the engineers, the lawyers, the investors, the, the civil engineering companies, the architect from Dubai who flew in just to do this. And you're thinking, why would an architect from Dubai fly into this event here in our town? This makes no sense. You're onto something, my friend. You're at the early stages of greatness, and that's how you win these big projects. All right. Here's another one. I've seen this one. The Economic Forum 
on legume production in the Midwest. You're like, oh my goodness. But then you start to hear that there's going to be a spur railway happen. And that spur railway is going to make an old town that had been on the decline, maybe have a little bit of bump because they're going to put a siding in there. And you think to yourself, geez, I wish I could scrape together a few bucks to buy some real estate. And all around you in that room are the architects, the engineers, the designers, the lawyers, and the real estate investors who are thinking the very same thing. And isn't it funny, my friend, Jeff Gratney, they're going to need to power these things. They're going to need to put power along this rail siding. They're going to need to power those buildings. They're going to need to build, right? Chandler Bing is there and he wants to build some hotels. And where is he going to build hotels? Well, he just bought some land near where that new spur railway siding is going. So that's how these things work. Okay. Um, I want you to think about this to answer the question. Where do land developers, architects, and city planners go to hang out? Oh, it's going to be dry. I mean, they're, they're good people, don't get me wrong, but it's not going to be super exciting. But go find out where the land developers in your town hang out. What events do they go to? Where do architects go to get their information? Where do they go hang out when they're doing their marketing? Where do city planners go to learn their information? Uh, you might find the Conference of Municipal Leaders happening. Oh, so much fun. What about the Association of Police Chiefs, police chiefs who are having a meeting in your town? Well, what are they going to need, Jeff? They're going to need uh, high security, and that's going to have to be delivered you know, by uh, having solid electrical systems in place. Maybe they need uh, uh, diesel backup generators in a secure facility. Just so happens you're an expert at that. And you know who else is going to be there? The really, really smart guy in your city who also does concrete work because he knows at the Association of Police Chiefs meetings, he's going to learn things that are going to help him be more valuable to that crowd. So look for those weird meetings, right? What I want you to do is network and you're going to be a lion in a room full of zebras. By being in that room, you're going to elevate yourself automatically because the architect and the engineer standing uh, next to you while you're having a, a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, you're going to say, well, Jeff, what do you do? You're going to say, well, I'm an electrical contractor. And they're going to say, well, we're an architect and we only build... Um, uh, industrial facilities, and we only build hospitals, and we only build, et cetera, et cetera. And by virtue of the fact that you're in the room, they're going to go, well, this Jeff Gratney guy must be the electrician that works on these kinds of buildings as well. And so you start to move up the food chain, right? <clears throat> the next thing you want to do, this is a completely different strategy, is have strategic alliances with engineering firms, right? So who are the engineering firms that you can go hang out with? How can you create a strategic alliance with them? You're gonna to wanna to go find out who they are and then start to hang out in the places they hang out and then develop those relationships. These big deals come through relationships. They don't come through some um, bid network website. I mean, they can, but generally these come through relationships that you have to build. And you know, you know what it's like guys, you do a $10,000 contract and then everybody sees you as a $10,000 contractor. And then you start to do $15,000 contracts and everybody sees you as a $15,000 contractor. And then you take a jump up to 30,000. Everybody goes, hey, Jeff did a good job at 30 grand. He's our $30,000 contractor guy. And you keep moving your way up until you're the $50,000 contractor guy and $100,000 contractor guy. And you do that through these relationships. Get good. This is the next one. Get good at following another leader. So get really good. Jeff, you're going to be the leader in Montana for electrical work. Well, who's just like you in the plumbing world? Who's just like you in the uh, alarm installation world? Who's just like you in the landscape world? Who's just like you in the concrete forms world? Who's, uh, where are the guys that sell and service cranes going? Where are the guys that rent very heavy duty construction equipment going to hang out? When you can find where they are, you'll find the hotspot. Anyways, Jeff and everybody, I hope that helped you to understand how to do more civil, institutional, commercial work. It's a different kind of marketing, for sure. It's a clever kind of marketing, and it's much more like chess than it is like snakes and ladders. Thanks for your question, Jeff. I appreciate it. If you're listening to this and you have a question for me as well, please go to speakpipe.com forward slash ask Dom. Make sure to tell us a little bit about yourself and then leave your question. I'd be happy to answer it here on the podcast. Have a great day.